Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivas, the Carb Addiction Doc, and today we're going to tackle a topic that I think is important for everybody to understand. You don't have to understand the science behind it, but if you're interested, we'll go through some of that. The topic is gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is the production of sugar, primarily glucose, by the liver. Okay, so one of the reasons why it's safe never to consume carbohydrates, that carbohydrates are not essential for human survival, is because the liver in particular is extremely adept at converting different types of fats and different types of amino acids, which are the breakdown products of, of uh, or the building blocks of protein, into sugar. There are certain pathways in the liver that convert amino acids and uh, particular parts of fat into sugar, and then either store that sugar as glycogen or release it into the bloodstream. One of the, the statement I'm going to start with today is very important to understand this, and this is the difference between gluconeogenesis and eating carbohydrates. Gluconeogenesis is demand-driven. It is not supply-driven. And that's a critical distinction, because... When you eat food, let's say you eat a pizza or you eat some spaghetti or you eat carbohydrate, the human body has to deal with that supply. And it has mechanisms to deal with a small supply of carbohydrates. But if you repetitively overwhelm that system, it gets into trouble. And it's that oversupply that causes so much of the ravages of metabolic syndrome, whether it's diabetes, obesity, and all the metabolic syndromes, the hypertensions, all those kinds of things, that is an overdrive of supply. Our sugar should primarily come from our liver, where the supply is demand-driven, not supply-driven. In other words, the body will only produce sugar when it perceives a need for sugar. And there are certain conditions where that is necessary. One of the things the human body does is it very tightly clamps a normal blood sugar in a range of about 70 to 99, 70 to 100 millimoles per liter. Oh, sorry, milligrams per deciliter. Um, uh, that's the American non-decimal uh, um, way of, of putting things. And the human body has a number of complex systems, hormonally driven systems, that keep sugar in that range, in that very tight clamp. And if you don't consume carbohydrates, your blood sugar typically lives at that low range in the 65 to 75, maybe 80 um, milligrams per deciliter at that low range. And then glucagon is your primary hormone that is creating the production of that sugar, either by releasing it from stored glycogen in the liver cells or by the conversion of two particular substrates. And the two most important substrates that the liver uses to produce new sugar are amino acids, gluconeo, uh, gluconeogenic amino acids, and glycerol, which is the backbone. When you hear the word triglycerides, which is the way that fat is typically transported in the body, you've got this glycerol molecule, and then you've got three fats stuck into that, three fatty acid chains stuck into that. Well, that glycerol backbone enters the gluconeogenic cycle together with amino acids and can be converted to glucose that can be stored or, or put into the human body. Now, there are byproducts of that, the use of certain amino acids. Some amino acids are ketogenic, become ketone bodies. Most of them become sugar. Some of them can become ketones or sugar. Some of them can only become sugar. So in the um, amino acids can be converted to sugar. There are byproducts of the conversion of protein to sugar. We get the production of uric acid. We get the production of oxalic acid, of purines and pyrimidines, of products that, if accumulating in the human body, can join other, for example, oxalates can, can join with divalent cations, uh, your calciums, your magnesiums, and some of the heavy metals, and they can actually form crystals in your kidneys and in your joints causing arthritis and gout. But for the most part, those byproducts, if there's only a small amount being converted at any one time, they just become part of the waste product in the urine and in the poop. So uh, a very efficient system 
unless it is flipped across to the other side. If your insulin levels are very high and you are insulin resistant, now you can't use fat as a primary fuel source, so you have to overproduce and oversupply sugar to the body. And if you don't eat for a period of time, your body's taking massive amounts of protein and converting it to sugar. And that can become problematic. And that's where gout and, and oxalic acid, uric acid crystals, oxalic acid crystals occur in the joints and in the kidneys. But if you are in fat-adapted ketosis, where the majority of your fuel needs are supplied by fat, then the supply by the liver to the bloodstream of sugar is just like a little trickle. Now, if, if I get a fright and I walk around a big rock and there's a saber-toothed tiger and I've got to run away, my cortisol levels go up, cortisol triggers glucagon, and glucagon pours sugar into the bloodstream. That, again, is a, a demand drive. So adrenaline, cortisol drive that sugar release and your sugar can spike up. The dawn effect, is, ask any diabetic what the dawn effect is, where your blood sugar rises in the early morning. Those effects are demand effects. Those effects are demand effects. But as you get into fat adapted ketosis, your demand goes way, way down. Your blood sugar stays the same, but the rate of removal of sugar from the bloodstream becomes less and less and less. Yes, there are certain cells like red blood cells and Schwann cells that have to use sugar, but they need a very small amount. And if most of your body is living on ketones and living on fat, your demand is very low. So therefore, your production can be very low. Your liver will store a certain amount between four and 600 grams. Your cells will store a certain amount for fright and flight mechanisms. But then you only need a tiny trickle to feed your bloodstream where, use gets, uh, where the sugar gets used up. And under those conditions, you need very, very, very little in terms of amino acid supply to meet the demand from the bloodstream. So very, very little protein is needed to be converted. Most of the protein is just the protein that you're using up, that you're breaking down in your body as part of wear and tear. And very little new protein that you eat or drink goes toward gluconeogenesis in a well-fat-adapted human being. So your insulin levels can be low, your glucagon levels can be low, all of your hormones can interact more as a vibration than these massive spikes and, and hollows. So the goal is for gluconeogenesis, for that demand on gluconeogenesis as a production of sugar by the liver to be trivial. And in fact, if you're in ketosis and you're using fat as your primary fuel source, fat from triglycerides, that glycerol backbone becomes the dominant thing. It's a waste product in, for most people, or it's a source of unnecessary energy. But if that becomes the primary component of gluconeogenesis, and remember the body will use glycerol equally as well as it will use amino acids, the few amino acids that your body then needs for tissue repair as a hormone, as an enzyme, for muscle building, tiny, tiny amount. So here's the bullshit. The bullshit is if anyone tries to tell you how much protein you should eat. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. If you're insulin resistant and your, hormones are your hormonal milieu is completely screwed up and you stop eating carbohydrates and you get yourself... Uh, you're going on a low-carb diet or something. Yes, you're going to use massive amounts of sugar, of, of, of protein to convert it to sugar because your body's still in sugar demand. And if you're not eating it, you're going to use a huge amount of protein for sugar. It happens. Ask diabetics eating a steak if they have a type 2 component. But type 1 diabetics who don't have a type 2 component, they don't spike when they eat a steak. So... It is not always true that a type 1 has to dose with insulin to treat the consumption of protein. It depends on their background state. Are they in fat-adapted ketosis or are they in glycosis where they need sugar as their primary fuel source and they're churning that sugar all the time? Nobody knows how much protein you need to eat because nobody knows how your body is currently working. I can predict, based on the blood work of my patients, how much protein they actually need. 
So if someone's in fat adapted ketosis, they need very, very little protein, even if they're high performance athletes or bodybuilders, because most of that protein is going to go down the nutrition arm. But if you're a uh, in a, a type 2 diabetic, or you have a type 2 component to your type 1 diabetes, or you're profoundly insulin resistant, you need massive amounts of protein. So understanding how your body works, understanding the concept of gluconeogenesis, which is essentially controlled in a very complex hormonal feedback pattern. Testosterone, insulin, estrogen, glucagon, cortisol, adrenaline, all these hormones, a uh, uh, thyroid hormone, all of these hormones interplay to manage energy supply to the human body. And unless you understand that, no dietitian can ever tell you how much you should eat. Unless they understand where you are. That's the fallacy of treating everybody in the same box. The healthiest state you can be in is fat-adapted ketosis. And then all you're eating is a small amount to make up for losses and for some energy. That is the healthiest state to be in. I hope understanding gluconeogenesis helps. I hope over time you'll understand how protein works as well. Thank you.